sharing your thoughts on that occasion. Because the mountaintop experience, which is the real world, you see, what they're going to do, what people do is drive a wedge between these and say all of that is unreal. Religion doesn't work for you. You know, you've got to have money. You've got to have education. You've got to have connections to get by in life. None of that religious business will help you. That's a false dichotomy there. Really, it's a false substitution that might be called the great reversal. The roles of the worlds have been reversed. Because the power of the experience of the real world, i.e. Matthew 17, 1, the transfiguration, was to last throughout the rest of their week for them. That, gave, that was the thing to give them the power to live in this demon-controlled substitute world. Not the real world. That is the real world. I mean, the real world, let's face it, in light of eternity, is heaven above. And so whatever is most like heaven above, down below, transfiguration, the anointings of the Holy Spirit, what is most like heaven above, down here below, is the real world then, is that which is most patterned after the real world, with the real world being the world above. Notice that Jesus didn't have any problem. He went from the transfiguration, all of that which was the real world, down into this valley of a demon-controlled substitute world, a world that had been stolen and that had an unclean, evil spirit in print controlling it now, and he was no less of the person that he was on top of the mountain. He came right to the boy and rebuked the demon, and the demon came out of it. I mean, the experience there on the mountain was to empower him the life in the real world was to empower him to continue to live in a demon-controlled substitute world. Because this world that we can see and touch and what you face out there in the world, it's not the real world, it's not the good world, it's not the good earth. You can either believe Pearl Buck's book titled The Good Earth or the Apostle Paul's words in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4 that this age is a present evil age. Turn with me over there. We, we mentioned that in a recent teaching. I mentioned it again tonight. Let's just look at it together. It's a very short verse, but it's a very meaningful one. Well, the verse is not short, but that one phrase in the middle of it that we're looking for is Galatians 1.4, who gave himself for our sins. Now, here's God's estimation of this life and this world, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. It's the present world. And, and which one is it? It's this one. It's not like a present one that's up in heaven. It's the present world. Which is that? It's this one. And how does Paul characterize it? It is evil. It is the substitute world. What was real life? All of Daniel's phantasmagoric visions of the cruel realities of an exiled people. What was reality? The horrors of the besieged city of Jerusalem? or the millennial temple visions that were given to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 40 to 48. See, people often say, well, now, real life is the sea. That's real life. And I don't know about these millennial temple visions or these phantasmagoric visions of beasts and animals and creatures that Daniel is having. Daniel is simply give, get, being given a little foretaste of what the real world is all about. That is the real world. See, if we, can, if we can be convinced by the Word of God of that, that is the real world. The supernatural and the visions and the anointings of the Holy Spirit, that is the real world. The world that we, that we sometimes call because we've been deceived by others or that we hear others call around us now, this is the real world, is in fact not that. What was real life? The apocalypses of John and Revelation? Or the reality of the fact that he was an exile on a barren, rocky Aegean Sea island, Patmos. What was real life to John? I would argue real life to John was the vision that he received. Real life to Daniel were all of the anointings, the visions, and the dreams that he had been given. A substitute type of life. And again, this isn't from a Christian science perspective that you deny this. It's simply admitting what Scripture says that 
the devil is a thief and he has stolen this world and it is no longer a very good Genesis 1.31 world. It is a Galatians 1.4, this present evil world. It's not real life. People tend to think of ministers or Christians in general, but ministers, well, now they live in an unreal world because they're always dealing with scripture or, you know, things like that. They live in an unreal world and, you know, the rank and file, we've got to live in a real world. That's a false thinking pattern right away. The real world is the spiritual world. Truth. The Word of God. Amen. Our experience is here when the church is together, the body of Christ. When he said that if two or three of you are there, there am I in the midst of you. Speaking in tongues. That is the real world. That's the way God intends. I mean, if you want to take it all the way back to the garden, where in the world did Adam get all of that knowledge that he had? He didn't get it by learning and by education. He was so intelligent that he could name all the creatures and the beasts that came before him. You know, you can kind of, if you'll follow the analogy here with me briefly before it just totally breaks down, you can kind of compare that with speaking in tongues. I mean, it's just a gift to him. Where did he get that knowledge? He didn't get it by, quote, living in the real world. He got it from God. Because with all of our intelligence, I doubt, I know we couldn't, I know I couldn't, and I'm probably as smart as most of you in here, if you just ran a line of animals in front of you, think of a name for them as fast as you can. One that you've never heard of before. Make it up. Create it your own. You couldn't do it. You'd be saying, and all of a sudden here'd come a lion, and you're doing pretty good until you got to the lion, and you said, lion. I mean, no, I can't call him that. Adam already named him that. Um, crocodile. No, I couldn't. That's something named for some other animal. Think of, oh, a crocodile. No, you use a combination of something you already knew. Just create something out of the blue. Said all the animals passed in front of Adam, and he named all of them. There's the real world in the garden, in the pre-fall, pre-sin garden. The superhuman intelligence that the man Adam possessed. Superhuman intelligence. Superhuman knowledge and wisdom. All corrupted in the fall. He's all corrupted. That means everything post-fall is non-real. It's a delusion. It is a delusion. It is a deception. And what God is trying to do through the truth is to rescue us out of all of that mess. The real world is not when you wake up tomorrow and say, boy, it's, those messages, they really sounded good last night. I'm going to go to work now today. you got to rearrange your whole thing and say, well, now I've got to live a deluded life today. <laughs> last, last night was real living. Well, today, I guess I'll be deluded today. No, of course, you're supposed to carry last night with you today. That's how you do it. Otherwise, you are living just a deluded life because, because your experiences, your sense perceptions will tell you religion doesn't work, prayer doesn't work, God isn't alive. That's what your sense perceptions will tell you. You know, I've got to work. I can't just stop and just, you know, think heavenly thoughts all day long. I'll starve doing that. That's immediately what your sense perceptions tell you, that here's real living. That's a delusion. See, real living is what's going to last forever. You won't have to work forever. Real life, real living is going to be forever. We just get a taste of it with truth, with study of the Bible, with a prayer life, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit right now. We just get a taste of what real living is all about. No one knows how to live. No one, these poor people who think they know tons of material about economics and politics and they got thousands of connections and they think that, you know, I'm well stocked for life here. And they look at you as kind of being a backwards person who's not in tune with real living or the real world. You know, that isn't real life. You know, thinking religious thoughts all the time and how deceived those people are because the truth is so contrary to what they have just espoused. Because all of that type of life they have lived thus far is a wasted life. And it's not real life. We would never have what's said of Abraham over in Hebrews 11 or it would just have, you know, degenerated into allegorical, mythological confusion there that Abraham was wandering around looking for a city whose foundation was built by God, whose builder and maker was God. And you turn back to Genesis and, you know, you search in vain for that to be proven in Genesis. You know, he's going from one locale to another where does it say he's looking for New Jerusalem? That's what Hebrews means in Hebrews 11. He's looking for New Jerusalem. Where do you even get the idea? That's not even written. 
until Revelation 21. Well, I know it's in Isaiah too, but Abraham lived several millennia before Isaiah though. But yet, that's what we're told. That, that means that's the truth about Abraham, what his life journey was about. He wasn't going to look for greener pastures or better land. He was looking for New Jerusalem. Not meaning to imply that he thought he could find it, you know, oh, maybe a couple of miles left of Bethel on the other side of Jordan. That he'd ever find New Jerusalem there, but he knew that, that he had to live a life that was faithful to God and consistent with the city above if he ever hoped to see the city above. And aren't we told that in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 that all liars and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and the fearful and the unbelieving will have no place in New Jerusalem. That's Revelation 21, almost a quote from around verse 7. We'll have no place in New Jerusalem. If you haven't lived consistently with the real city above, you'll never make it into that city then. And see what quote, real, unquote, life down here tells us as well. Now, you have to lie occasionally anyway to survive in life. Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, or the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And the end of that chapter, verse 27, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. And then over in chapter uh, 22, verse 15, For without, see you get it, both chapters are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Abraham traveled around living a life consistent with the city above because he was looking for the city above and not to his life below here. He knew that's what real life is all about. Real life is living as though God were alive. Real life is living as though truth is eternal and not dependent on situations or expediency or whatever. What was real life? You see, we tend to read you know, some of these stories of the great, great saints of old, like in the Old Testament or in the New, but... I'm especially thinking of the Old Testament prophets with all of their visions and symbols and acting out of prophecies and so forth that they had. Well, you know, people even today try to do a, a psychological study of the man Ezekiel and conclude with this thought. The man was touched in his mind. Any man to run around and do some of the weird things that Ezekiel did has to be touched. Well, see, that's judging with a carnal mentality, though. Judging with a carnal mentality. What was more real, the millennial temple visions that he got or the horrors of the siege of the city? See, if the people would have just been faithful enough to God and had their minds enough on the millennial temple visions that were being given to Ezekiel and lived a life that was consistent with the truth and the revealed will of God, they never would have gone through the siege of Jerusalem. That was the deception, the delusion, the fall that Satan calls them to go into. All that's satanically produced, not produced by God above. All that's evil here, all these things as we looked at earlier with the discussion on the first part of the title, living fearlessly. Of, well, now what happens if you are one of the small number of casualties where you have to have insurance or medical help or whatever? And we've again confused the situations of the world. We've again swapped reality for unreality. If you've ever, well, I don't even need to say it like if you've ever because I know it's happened to all of us. When you've been in some service with a tremendous anointing and God was showing you things, or it could be even at home on your own, and there was an anointing present and he was revealing things to you and you're rejoicing and leaping and shouting and praising and clapping and then somebody knocks on the door. And so you go to the door, answer the door, and before you know it, they talk you right out of all of that. Unintentionally, perhaps. I mean, they didn't come. Maybe it was a Christian friend thinking, I'm going to talk them out of their real experiences that they're having in there. 
I passed by the bedroom window and heard them in there. I'm going to talk them out of all that nonsense now. No, it's all unintentional, but they just start talking about the mundane, the mundane, the illusions of this world, the mundane, the stupid things of life that maybe you do have to do, but they're still the non-essentials of life. You start talking about that, and all of a sudden, what happened? Poof! You got talked right out of that mount of transfiguration that you just had. When you look back on that, you look back with suspicion on that. I wonder. And you say, well, now, wait a minute. Now I'm even myself split into two people because back then I thought it was good because I was in it. And now I don't. And I guess the reason why I thought it was good was because I was in it then. Now I can look at it objectively, you know, outside of the experience. And it will never make sense to the old carnal mind that always wants something that he can rationally explain. It'll never make sense to him. I mean, do you not think that at some mornings Daniel got us after some visions the night before, you think about these visions that he had of beasts and colossal images? And Daniel has to think back on that, and it's supposed to be some type of prophecy and of Nebuchadnezzar. He even identified him as the head of gold, and then in chapter 7 and 8 he goes on to identify the next two kingdoms gives the fourth one. He just said it's dreadful and terrible and strong, exceedingly kingdom. Supposed to be prophecies of world events in the future. And you get up the next morning, I wonder if it's all really going to happen that way. You have to believe that what God gave you was true and real. I dare say there are probably a whole lot of people, even in the charismatic movement, who, with the exception, perhaps, of their baptism in the Spirit, the initial experience, which oftentimes comes with some type of anointing, greater or smaller degree, but some type of anointing, with the exception of that, go through a large part, perhaps all, perhaps the rest of their charismatic life, with no more anointing. They don't even know what anointings are. Am I talking to any of you here? They don't even know what anointings are. They had it once, the night they were gloriously filled with the Spirit. All heaven came down, they sing, or say, if they don't know the song, and glory filled my soul. And then, next year, the next year, the next year. I think we talked about this in the last chapter in Screw Tape Letters. You hit that crisis of middle age. The coming of age in middle age, which I think Revelation 3 says is really uh, middle age phase of lukewarmness. But it says, no, wait a minute, I didn't go up in the rapture like I thought I would, and so I've got to put my feet down on the ground, get my heads out of the cloud, and start making preparation for the future. You know, whenever I first was saved, baptized in the Spirit, I was convinced the rapture wouldn't be after 1976. Amen. I was really convinced of that. And then when 76 came, I was convinced it was 77. And then when I thought of like, you know, the late 1980s, I mean, that was like 15 years in the, in the future, 13 years in the future. Well, I never even thought of that, like late 1980s. And so what happens when you hit the like late 1980s? Well, so that proved all my theories about the rapture, 1976, of course, that was proven to be false. I didn't have any revelation. I'm just saying your thoughts and expectations and anticipations are for it to be that day, that week, that month, that year, or the next. 1977, that proved to be erroneous. And 1978, well, that was futile wishing. And so 1988, 1990, 1996, 2001, I've got to get my feet on the ground, my head out of the clouds, and put my hand to the worldly plow out there and do something about life. And I'll probably live till I'm about 65 or 70 or 75, and then I'll die and go to be with the Lord. Preparation is like made for the first couple of years of the Christian's experience. We discussed this last week. Preparation made for the first couple of years, and then, well, it's just all chucked then. i got to get my head out of the clouds, my feet on the ground, and do something about real life here. And these visions that I had, and these supernatural experiences, and my great charismatic anticipations for God to use me in some great, marvelous way or what he perhaps had shown me through someone else or through my own self earlier. Well, all of that, I just charge all of that to naivete, the illusions of new convertitis, 
or maybe even the delusion of the devil. Someone might go so far as to say that when it was the Lord himself who really showed us that. And the only reason it hasn't happened, perhaps, is because, as with most of his words, they're conditional. And we didn't do what we were supposed to do. I wonder how many people have been shown of the Lord, this is what you're to do, or something, and they, they hold off on it, you know, too long. They don't do it. They hold off too long, keep waiting and waiting and waiting, and then it never kind of, you know, is fulfilled or happens in their life. And so they think that they're, they think they got the smarts now. They think they're wise because they look back on it and say, see, I'm glad I didn't do anything about that because look, proved after all that wasn't for me. But see, that word was conditional though. I mean, what, just take myself for an example. What, what if I, see, I was given some words through prophecy, through several different people as well as the inner testimonies of my own heart that the Lord was calling me to teach, to be a teacher in the body of Christ. So what if I would have, you know, become 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, got out of college, 24, 25, 26, mom and dad kick you out of the house, they don't want you sponging on them anymore, 27, 28, well, nothing's happening, 29, 30, 31, I don't know, I thought I had a word from the Lord, 32, 33, 34, Guess I was wrong. 35, 36, 37. Suppose I better go find a job, get married, have a family, settle down, and do something about life. Then the end of it then. I mean, it was a step of faith. I had a call, but I had to do something about it, though. Getting out there in the real world is what it was all about. Not quote-unquote real world, either. The real world, the spiritual world or you have to live by faith. I, I'm not saying that every time someone has suspected they had a call or that God was showing them this is what was going to happen or whatever, that it was truly from the Lord. I'm not meaning to imply that, but I do wonder, I think back on some of my earlier acquaintances, all, most of them anyway, the brothers in the group, assumed they had some type of call to something besides nothing in life, or divorce and remarriage, or fornication, or apostatizing from the faith. None of them felt they had a call to any of those things. They felt they had a call to something. And none of them are in anything, though. As a matter of fact, some of them got called out of what they were in. At least that's what they suspected. One former friend, I'll never forget, we were visiting them in Texas, and, and we knew they were just leaving the faith. I mean leaving the faith. The whole charismatic faith. Tongues were, you know, really not that necessary. It's a divisive issue. Let's not talk about it. Man, they were so pro-radical tongue speaking and everything when I knew them earlier, but this wasn't the same person, a different person. They'd been deceived by the devil. Tone all of these things down, and the day we happened to visit them was the day that he had to go into the health department to get his, you know, yearly shot. And I, I even rode in the car with him in. And, you know, I had been in the health department for years. And it was in Dallas. It was a huge place. I mean, it was like it reminded me of an airport terminal. That's what it was like in there. It wasn't a little small office building. It was like an airport terminal. There were hundreds of people in there to get all types of shots. I'd never been in a health department like that before. I mean, there were tables where you just stood in line. And one right after another up there, boom, put the plunger in and squirt the juices in your arm. And then you go down to the next table, injection, down to the next one. And I stood over, it was just like an airport terminal with full glass windows, you know, on the outside that looked out. And I just stood over there looking out, just thinking, my, we tried to share with, with that man and his wife, but they wouldn't receive it at all. We didn't want to have anything to do with it. And they were in it before us, and they were some of the ones who talked us into it. And then the people that we really wanted to see, which were um, this girl's parents, this woman's parents, whenever they found out, that we were going to be in town. They left out of town, out of state, as a matter of fact, because they didn't want to see it. We found that out because we went for a drive the next afternoon with this man, I just told you his story, with his wife. We went for a drive with her the next afternoon to her parents' home. And we got there, you know, she said, well, we know that, you know, they're going to be happy to see you and all this. We pull up and we knock and no one's there. And she said, I know what happened. She said, we told them that you were going to be here today. And she said they packed up and left. I mean, this was a grown 
couple. I mean, not no teenager. That is 40, 45 years old. Scared to see us. Scared to face us. They packed up and left for a, well, it must have been an 800-mile trip, 1,600 miles round trip. It's not like they just went to hide in the motel down at the corner of the street or something. They packed up and went out of state to avoid us. We just wanted to come by and visit. We probably would have done more than visit, though. We told them a thing or two. But they packed up and left out of state. Now, see, what they, what they came to, their conclusion was, we haven't been li living in the real world. Their argument was, why is it those who seem to be right and have the truth are growing fewer and fewer and smaller and smaller in number? Said, and all the people that are wrong, you know, their churches are just bursting at the seams. The old number mentality, the old adding machine mentality deceived those people. It has deceived many people. Many people over the years, the old adding machine mentality is what I like to call it. And so they gave up the church and the ministry and gave up the faith and I think went into electronics after that. I don't know where they are today. I know they had to get out of the ministry because they lost the church. My, my, my. Wanted to get in with all the other full gospel folk around, you know, full gospel folk. JDS heretics, shepherdship bondage teachers, Women preachers, because she was one in the group here. You know, the whole mixed bag of charismatic, non-charismatic confusion. Get mixed up in all of that. And what did that do for them? What did their real life do for them? Well, we often have tried to get in touch with them in the past, not over the last few years, I don't suppose, but earlier we have. And, you know, they'd be doing I don't know what. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he was a garbage collector today. That's what his dad was, his background. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's what he's doing today. At least if he's not, he's collecting religious garbage in church. Garbage collector. Lost the ministry, lost the church, lost the faith. Doesn't believe in any of that. And you heard a letter I read from another family that we know just the other night, and all they can give is a bragamony of what their children are accomplishing in school. Sports, athletics. Mathematic decathlon, beauty school, totaling cars, buying condos. Not a word about Jesus. Name doesn't even appear. And well, those Rosses, poor things. We knew they were touching their head. That that young Ross boy, when he used to be here, he was he was just he was the most radical. He, he, I know what he was too radical. He was a fanatic. And look where it got him now. He stuck. His eyes had never gotten open about the real world, about real life. Still calling everyone but his wife and his son a heretic. You know, everybody outside his group is a heretic. That's his own family. That's pretty much true, you know. Some of your families, I guess, we'd include with ours. But outside of that, nothing but a bunch of heretics out there. Known heretics that can be proven from the Word of God. One of the big JDS teachers, former farmer. I'll tell you that much about him. I'm not going to mention names. I won't mention names, though. I'm not going to mention names. But a former farmer that should have stayed with his hogs instead of coming into the fold with the sheep. I don't think he farmed hogs. It was corn or soybeans or something. But well, he called up and offered to help this former friend of ours who was a pastor and a minister help him get started in the ministry again. One pastor helping another get started. How can a pastor help a pastor get started in the ministry? Well, that farmer's not a pastor, but he was going to help this man by, you know, giving him some contacts in his area of some JDS people because he's a well-known JDS teacher. I'll give you some JDS sheep there to take care of. Well, this former friend of ours was an anti-JDS person. He was earlier. But, of course, doctrine's divisive. You've heard that old argument. Doctrine's divisive. They gave all of that up. So you shepherd a group of goats. <laughs> it, it only fits you're a goat as a pastor. But what a calling for a pastor that your whole group is nothing but a bunch of goats because they're JDS deceived folk and all the other deceptions they're in. Well, they can pat me on the back and say, poor old Brother Ross. And I'm just laughing all the way to heaven about the matter. You've heard about laughing all the way to the bank. Well, we're laughing all the way to the kingdom about the matter. <laughs> Not laughing at them, but I'll tell you, the devil is a wily foe. We've got to stay on the word, and the word's always going to be just contrary to what everyone else wants to do or say or believe. You can always find what the world is doing or believing and say, well, let's just turn around opposite direction 
and put our marching shoes on and start marching. Because you know you're going to be heading somewhere, at least in the vicinity of the kingdom. It may not be straight there because the devil may have a deception that's kind of close to the kingdom, but if you can get your back on the deception, the kingdom will be out there somewhere in front of you. Straight in front of you, a little bit off to the right, a little bit to the left. It'll be somewhere in front of you, though, with those deceptions behind. But it's back to this, this area, oh, of fear, of fear of the world, of fear of what other ministers are going to think about us. I got letters in my files from this one former pastor. What are other ministers going to think? They've already named us a legalistic, exclusive group. This was a former group of theirs. A legalistic, exclusive group, and we're not winning any new sheep, and they're just growing by leaps and bounds in their midst. Well, you see, that all sounds good. That sounds like the real world. I mean, if you've got the truth, well, why aren't there people there? I'll tell you why. I just told you why. When you've got the truth, you won't have very many people there. See, the whole argument is perverted here. Well, if you got the truth, you got the truth, people are going to be there. I think that'd be the chief argument against people being there, according to Jesus and his life, right? Isn't that right? Well, if you've got the truth, you're going to have people... Probably not. If you've got untruth, you'll have a lot of people. They'll flock to hear religious deceptions of every type and persuasion. They'll stand in line and pay money to be deceived. But they wouldn't cross the street to hear the Word of God. It's too hard on them. You know, I've got to live this. I can't have my old carnal enjoyments and my perverted notions about things and still get into the kingdom. I've got to be stripped of all of that. That's right. It's too hard for them to live. The way is too narrow. They want to have all their old carnal worldly enjoyments and their perverse thoughts and their religious deceptions and errors and heresies and say, well, our church is just going to be as broad as the love of Jesus. Oh, doesn't that sound so saccharine sweet? Our church, our arms, our teaching, our love is going to be just as broad as the heart of God. Oh, it's saccharine, all right. It's not sweet, it's saccharine. It's a false artificial sweetening is what it is because that's not true. Jesus said the way is narrow. Turn with me over into John chapter 8. That's a long chapter of his discourse with these people. I'm assuming we've all got that 12th verse memorized now. Hallelujah. What a beautiful verse. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of light. And so every time he has something to say, the Pharisees have something to say about what he said. I mean, just back and forth, on and on and on. Now their, their, their claim is after that, because he testified of himself, I'm the light of the world. And they're quoting him what he said back in chapter 5. Well, you're bearing record of yourself. You told us earlier that your record's not true if you bear it of yourself, only if your father bears witness or record of you. Well, they miss the meaning of the statement. You can find it back in chapter 5. And he's not contradicting himself in verse 14 by saying, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. Even though he said otherwise in 5. It's a different context, a different meaning now. But the Pharisees, you see, are bound to the literal words. They can't perceive spiritually. They're bound to the literal words. If you read back in chapter 5, Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And so he says here in chapter 8 and verse 12, I'm the light of the world. I think that's testifying about yourself. And so the Pharisees, right away, we've got you, verse 13. We've got you in a contradiction. But all they can hear are the literal words that are said. Well, we can't get into the interpretation, but you have to think about it. It has a spiritual meaning behind it. And so it goes on, of course, to talk about the origin of the people back and forth about who Jesus is. That's the question, like in verse 25. You know, tell us plainly, who are you? And Jesus is trying to get them to deal with the matter of who are they. They think that they are the children of God. They're asking him, who are you? He's trying to get them to deal with, but who are you? It does make all the difference in the world, who am I? But it also makes a lot of difference, who are you? So verse 19, where is thy father? A lot of questions and then answers, or statements and then responses. Then in verse 22, another question. Will he kill himself? Because he said, wherever I go, you can't come. 
He says in verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. So they say unto him, you know, plainly, who art thou? Because they saw that Exodus 3 reference there, I am. And Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, and he goes on, getting down to verse 30, and he spake these, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those which believed on him. Now I think we've got two different groups of people here because the on in verse 31 really shouldn't be there. You've got some believing on him. I mean, they believe on him. You've got some that believe him. There's a difference. In other words, they believe some of the things that he has to say. They don't believe him on him, verse 30. That's why he has this to say to them in these well-known verses here, I think, in our church. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Now, if you're a disciple, you're a disciple. You don't have to somehow grow into being one. So if he's addressing people who already have faith in him, seen with the word on in verse 31, would have a contradiction on our hands here in 31b. But no, he's not talking to people who believe on him, but people who have believed him. And he said, if you'll continue in the word, you've got to continue in it, you, so you'll get to the place of verse 30, believing on me. Then you'll be my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He's speaking to people who have not been set free yet, people who are just convinced of some of the things that he has to say. Well, how often we see this of people today, convinced of a few things about Jesus or a few things about God, they don't believe on him. Because to believe on means to put your total, well, we read it in screw tape letters tonight, commitment, your total faith, your total trust in him. Not just a belief of him or a belief about him, but a belief on him, a belief in him. And that's what he's addressing these people toward in verse 31 and verse 32, to get them to go all the way and deal with the one that, as they uh, have said earlier, well, we know who this man is. We know his mother, Mary. We knew his father, Joseph. In other words, that was the real world to them. But you see, the, quote, real world is all seen very deceiving. That was all they could touch with their historical analysis, is we can trace his genealogy back here to Mary. And what they didn't see, what they didn't know, what they didn't realize was the supernatural aspect of his conception in the womb of a virgin. You see, that's what historical details, that's what, quote, real, quote, unquote, living, real life, quote, unquote, will do. It'll lead you down a blind alley and deceive you. Because if you follow the genealogy, well, he's not, couldn't be God, he was born of a woman. Gods are above, or God singular is above, men are below. Gods are not born. Gods are not born. My mind would tell me that. Gods are not born. Gods are eternal, from everlasting to everlasting. My mind tells me that. Real life tells me that. Gods are not born. Well, in one sense, you're right, but your old mind has gotten in your way. Your old mind, the old mind, the old carnal thinking has gotten in your way. It won't allow you to go far enough. To say, now, is there something else about this man that maybe we don't know? So he was born of Mary. Was she a virgin? Well, that'd make all the difference in the world then. My mind doesn't tell me things like that. We know he, he was born of Mary, but, but what was her sexual state at the time? Virgin or past virginity? She was a virgin, and he was born of her. We've got a miracle on our hands then. Amen. We've got a man who, according to what we've been able to investigate, did come from Mary, but we've got a man that's more than a product of Mary. And that is the real world. You see, what was the real world there? The real world wasn't just your genealogical statistics that you could unearth down at the town clerk's office. That's all the real world will lead you to do is go unearth some statistics down at the record or registrar's office. But the real world, the truly real and spiritual world, oh, that's another matter entirely. 
that is the world from which he came and of which he was a part. And that was the part to which he was inviting these people. If you'll continue in my word, you'll be my disciple, like some of these others are. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And proof of the fact you aren't my disciple is you don't know the truth. And proof of the fact you don't know the truth is you're not set free. And proof of the fact you are not set free is you are a slave of sin. And every man who commits sin is a slave of sin. And you're not free. And finally, he has to just come right out and tell them who they are. He's told them who he is all along. He said it in verse 24, I am. He said it again in verse 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I am, you know, you don't go around calling yourself, I am. Well, some people do, but they are touched in the, the brain or the mind. First of all, they go out wandering all through the drug culture and across college scenes asking that question, Who am I? Who am I? And then finally one day they wake up and say, I know, I am that I am. Well, they are touched with a demonic delusion in their mind. And I guess that's what they thought about Jesus. Said we not, well, thou art a Samaritan and hast a demon, verse 48. But he goes ahead and tells them who you are, verse 44. Ye are your father, the devil. That's where part of this conversation has been headed so far. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so in conclusion, let's come back to some things we've looked at here in screw tape letters. The bottom of page 142. It turns on making him feel when first he sees human remains plastered on a wall that this is what the world is really like and that all his religion has been a fantasy. And that all his religion has been a fantasy. You know, it's not going to work. It's not the daily chores around the house. It's not a child crying during the middle of the night. That's real living and that's real life. But those seem to be the very things because they are the things that we are most in tune with as humans born into a corrupt and fallen world a world that is satanically controlled, that we are most in tune to understanding and feeling and realizing and comprehending and recognizing. But if we think, and you've heard of this little metaphor all the time, in light of eternity, I think of what you're saying there. If you think, live, believe, act in light of eternity, that means in view of the light, the glorious light, the glow that eternity casts upon everything you think and do and live and believe and how you act in life. In light of eternity, in light of it, I guess you could say in view of it, but I think of in light of it, the light that it casts upon this very temporal existence that we have now. That, no, it isn't a life just for ministers or apostles or ecstatic prophets like Ezekiel or Daniel or Zechariah in the Old Testament. So, well, they were blessed with visions and all these revelations. That's what kept them going in that life. It's for all of us. It's something we have to believe that this present world is not Pearl Bunk's good world. It's not the good world. It's not the good earth. It's an evil world, an evil earth, a delusion, an illusion, a deception, a demon-controlled substitute world. 